it's great to be here. I uh, really appreciate being invited to speak. Um, it's been a good morning, afternoon where we get to see um, the idea of stewardship in action in, I suppose, culture and community. So I'm talking about um, <coughs> mitigating against the cost of success. So we're going to be talking about what that is, what it looks like, and some practical pointers about where it's going. Um, I should introduce myself first. My name is Ravine Das. Um, you can call me Rab. For later on, when you're drawing a blank about how to address me, you just think of ice cream. Um, it's a good <laughs> icebreaker for people. Um, that's how you pronounce it, um, more or less. And I'm a nutrition lecturer or educator or communicator. I'm not really sure what they call it these days, but I'm really passionate about um, nutrition and the interaction with lifestyle, um, sport, activity, everything. Um, so everyone really start feeling guilty about all the cookies you had and about the pizza that everyone was eating. But don't worry, I had a burrito at lunch, so it's okay. He's one of us. Um, so if we move on, if we we're looking at two costs today, um, there are more costs to our success than just two, but I thought we would address two today would be appropriate. So with this quote here, um, success has a cost, um, it's only being learned and understood in this generation. So you could argue that the past 100 years, Ireland has made a successful transition um, into, I suppose, a successful nation. So we've gone from a primarily labor-based workforce to a um, office-based, success-driven, um, sedentary workforce. And we've been doing that for, I suppose, the purposes of achieving something, so achieving that status um, associated with success, but also for the achievement of, I know it's for our families, it's for um, enjoying your life in the future, it's establishing that big retirement fund. But the point is, um, if we move on, um, we may never get to enjoy that retirement fund because of the cost of our success. So if we look at the idea of long work hours, constant sitting, um, our excessive reliance on our phones and our iPads and whatever, um, there's rent to be paid. And what we are only learning in the past few years and in the coming years is that rent is our health. Um, in particular, it's our physical, our mental and emotion emotional health. So if we unpack that for a minute, um, long hours sitting, oh, well, whoa, 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 we're going too fast there. Hold on, hold on, that's for a few minutes, but um, long work hours, so we're spending a lot more time in work, we're spending a lot more time away from, I suppose, the natural cycles of day and night, and that has a huge effect, it's a thing called circadian rhythms, and if we alter those, there is a little bit of a negative health impact on our lifestyle, or on our lives. Um, if you combine that with constant sitting, so it, I don't have to probably explain that to you, I'm sure you've seen all the postural kind of things of when people sit for too long, but it's just a natural thing. If we're sitting for too long, changes in our, in our I suppose, our hip structure, our um, shoulder structure start happening, and if you fast forward to you know, 30, 40 years when you wanna go play golf with all your money that you've amassed for your retirement fund, you can't do it because you're wrecked. Um, if, we, if we think about from, I suppose, from an emotional perspective as well and a mental health perspective, we spend a lot of time like this, avoiding interaction with other people, avoiding interaction with potentially our family and friends, and that does take a toll. And obviously the pressure of trying to succeed does affect how we interact and how we relate with each other. Um, and from an interventional perspective, nutrition and physical activity have a lot more to say than just having abs and having 100,000 followers on Instagram. Um, it is a big area that goes beyond that, and the wealth of literature at the minute is certainly trending in the positive direction for it being a um, preventive measure against things like um, mental health conditions, um, social isolation, and general health risks. So that's a big thing to look at. If we move on, um, Wally, profit for our time. Great, great film, uh, but as with all good kids' films, there's a meta-narrative operating for people to hopefully see. And that relates to the idea of the humans in the film who have become so self-absorbed and so um, self-gratifying by um, high palatability food being available to them. and um, They don't interact with each other, they don't actually have any form of activity that they've become, I suppose, a shell of what they were meant to be. And what we are meant to be is active and interacting um, creatures. 
And in, obviously, the beautiful epiphany moment in this film is where, um, in a time of crisis, one of the humans is forced to break away from this, um, I suppose, self-imposed cage of interaction and, and food and gluttony um, and save a life by stretching out a hand and seeing this person for the first time. And it's a real beautiful moment and I think it speaks of maybe where we're heading if we're not careful and not being good stewards of our health. Um, so if we move on to our second cost, um, move on one more time. This is what I have to deal with on a regular basis. It's um, <coughs> nutrition information on the internet. This is, this is my biggest battle. Um, for someone who works in this kind of education department, we don't know who's telling the truth because everyone has something to say. And to quote my brother, he said, it doesn't matter if you're right or wrong, if you have abs, people listen to you. So <laughs> it's, it's, a really bad, it's a really bad place to be. Um, so there's this idea of a ridiculous amount of nutrition information on the internet. So we don't know who's telling the truth, who do we sp what do we spend our money on, um, who do we believe. And as well as that, there's this other little thing that I'd like to address. Um, and this isn't just for my area of nutrition information and knowledge, but it's also, it's in every area. It's this idea of the preferred narrative. So there is a broader debasement of the public discourse. Too often facts become second to the preferred narrative, which is known as a greater truth. And this greater truth, I feel, lies also within our human nature, where we want the quick fix, we want um, to, I suppose, believe what is the easiest option rather than you know, doing some good digging and actually building a habit of sustainability, building a new behavior. We want a quick fix. So we have to battle this area as well. So then when we come to the next bit, we've got um, the great Spider-Man quote. Um, which isn't actually a great Spider-Man quote, if you pay attention to it. Um, that's great power, comes great responsibility. But we've given the wrong people the biggest voices when it comes to our nutrition education and our nutrition knowledge. Um, these people are maybe in their mind, they're telling the truth, but to be honest, they're, they're quite, they're acting like charlatans, and they are charlatans, I should say. Sorry, it's being too nice. Um, and they're snake oil salesmen, and they're playing on the public misinformation and the idea of the preferred, nar preferred narrative, and they're propagating that idea continually. And um, a lot of times they don't realize that this is to the detriment of the people they are trying to help, and um, there's real damage being caused. Um, so the quote, with great power comes a platform to make a sweet profit. Everyone can make money off selling something that sits with someone's ideal, you know, preferred narrative. Um, so that's, they're the two areas. So let's talk about some practical bits and pieces that can help. Um, so we avoid the self-propelling prophecy of Wally. Um, I'm not going to give anything mad, like you don't have to join a gym or go start running a 5K. I'm not going to say that right now. Uh, I will say, don't underestimate the power of taking a step away from your desk, um, getting outside into the open, taking a couple of deep breaths, because that has a really profound effect on our physiology and our, I suppose, how we perform mentally as well. Um, so just getting up, taking 10 minutes for every hour that you're sitting is a good idea. If that involves some form of stretching, some form of moving around, getting out into our sun, then <laughs> go ahead and try it. Um, I'm not big on supplementation, but because we are geographically poor when it comes to um, sunlight, Vitamin D has a huge um, list of benefits for, I suppose, the lifespan from a younger individual to the elderly individual when it comes to bone mineral density, um, muscle mass, um, being tanned, it's all really important. So it would be something that I would advise people to perhaps consider. From the area of the preferred narrative or um, avoiding nutritional misinformation on the internet, don't be afraid of any one particular food group. There is a myriad of things right now that are telling you that this is the cause of your problem and this is the cause of your problem. The answer is not gluten unless you are clinically diagnosed that you are a celiac or any sort of gut disorder. So it's not always that one particular food group should be avoided. Um, that just propagates fear and you end up with this kind of, oh, I can't eat that, I can't eat that, and you don't enjoy your life. And if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. So do your due diligence. Um, this doesn't apply to just um, nutrition. This applies to everything. Be a critical thinker of what's being said. 
So if we move on, um, where to find me? You can find me in Holland or Barrett, where I just listen. Um, I don't know whether that makes me a bad person or not, but um, other than that, you can find me on Facebook. I am on Twitter now, and I weep over the current state of things on Instagram. Um, so thank you.